I want to preach to you today that about from actually I was inspired to look into something that came across the pulpit on Friday night at the summer conference. We were blessed to be able to be there and uh, Pastor Brian Kinsey was the minister and he preached about um, from 2 Kings chapter 4. We'll get there in a minute. And um, I'm not preaching his message, although I suppose it's all from God. Um, although there was something that was came across as he was under the anointing of the Lord that pricked my heart. And um, I want to present it to you today. Everything we need in the house of God. <clears throat> Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unaware unnoticed, as it says here in this translation, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, I pray your anointing God to be here. Lord Jesus, I pray that You would help us to understand Your Word and love it in the name of Jesus. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. It's in this, these couple of verses that Jude, uh, the author, is giving us his reasons for writing um, And um, his reasons for writing um, about the salvation that we share and concern that we should stand up for the uniqueness of our faith. Our faith is unique. What we believe about the universe and God and our, even ourselves is unique in this world. It's not the majority. Amen. As a matter of fact, we could look at all us all across this uh, congregation, people from different nationalities, different colors, and we can all say we are a minority of the same degree because we follow God. But this is especially appropriate today for Christians with a multi-faith society faced with subtle infiltrations of so-called New Age teaching. Jude is alarmed at the two effects of false teachers. They have made the grace of God an excuse for permissiveness, and they have denied the uniqueness of Christ and His salvation, trying to accept and blend relig religions and accept faiths and, and belief systems and incorporate them into uh, their own. This is uh, what Jude is up against. And, Jude here is exhorting the church to remain faithful to the doctrine and teaching of the apostles that has already been delivered to the church. Because you see, in this church and in, in, in our, in, in, even in our own mindsets, there are, is sometimes a tendency to be looking once we have uh, understood something of God. Maybe we understand the Word of God. We seem to have this desire in our flesh to continue to look for something new and something different, maybe some greater understanding when all we need is Jesus and Him crucified. All we need is the Holy Ghost. We already have everything that we need in the Word of God and in the house of God. We don't need to continue to keep looking for some new revelation. We need to be able to understand the revelation of God that's already been delivered to the church. 
And he points out new teachers were coming in with new doctrines that perverted the gospel. And he pointed out that the new teachers were, uh, were, were, doing, were doing this and uh, they, they perverted the gospel message. And he points out that these new teachers were coming with new doctrines and they perverted the gospel message and warned them not to be enticed uh, by the, these, to follow these non-authoritative teachings. You've already been given... What you need to live for God, yet you continue to look for new things. And maybe I could paraphrase it. You're not even living fully for God according to the word of God that we already have. And yet you continue to look for some new exception to get into God without having to comply with his word. Now, I want to take this. I want to encourage you today to stay true to the Word of God and the message of salvation that has been delivered to the church and resist the temptation to always be looking for a new thing or a higher way or a greater understanding of God's Word that in any way negates the power of what we already have received in the Holy Ghost. Amen. There seems to be in the church some, some kind of a desire uh, uh, among those who believe that perhaps they um, have a greater enlightenment or maybe they're more educated than our forefathers. And, and perhaps we are, but uh, could that be to our detriment when we can't even have faith in Jesus Christ for the simple things and the right life? Amen. Amen. And I want to just juxtapose this warning of Jude over a miraculous and amazing story that took place in the Old Testament in order to remind us that we have everything that we need already in the house of God. We don't need to look for another revelation. We don't need to continue to seek for some new person or some new talent or some new thing. We have what we need according to God's divine providence in the church today to do what we have been called to do as the people of God. We don't need to look for these new ways and new things and new doctrines. Amen? We don't need a new understanding or a new revelation in order to grow in God, remain saved, or stay socially relevant, or whatever other false notion we sometimes hear from critics of our faith. We don't need to stay socially relevant. We need to be right with God. That needs to be our priority. And yes, we need to do. We do need to engage our culture. We do need to. uh, we, We do need to stop holding on to old traditions. But we never need to stop holding on to the truth of the word of God. Get rid of the traditions, but stay true to the word of God in righteousness and holiness and truth and power. And we have everything that we need to reach even this modern generation already in the book, amen, and already in the church because he is equipping us with his spirit. Turn your attention to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. And a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. They owed money to the creditor. They could not pay. And so uh, the uh, expectation was that these sons would become indentured servants to this creditor to pay off the debt. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. Could I get the church to repeat that? Uh, Tell me what you have in the house. And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. (laughs) Praise the name of the Lord. Then he said, go. Borrow vessels from everywhere, from your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut up the door behind you and your sons. Everybody say, you and your sons. Then pour into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went. 
from him and shut up the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God. (coughs) And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt and your son's Live on the rest. Praise God. Hallelujah. Church, this woman went looking outside for an answer. She went to the man of God. She was looking for an answer uh, on the outside because she was desperate. Yet God performed a miracle made up of the things that she already had at her disposal to meet her need. And that's what I want to juxtapose this against the warning uh, on, on Jude uh, in Jude 4. She did not think that her oil was of any value or use. I don't have anything except some oil. What good is this oil if I have nothing else? I don't have anything. I just have this oil. But yet God saw value in the oil when it was given to him and allowed the miraculous to take something that she thought was valueless. She dismissed perhaps the most valuable thing as nothing because it seemed so small and unusable. She didn't even consider her children or herself as assets in any way. She said, I don't have anything, I just have oil. She didn't say, I've got these two strong young men that could help me do something. She didn't even consider herself of any value. I have nothing except some oil. And the man of God said, you go get your sons. And you go get some oil. And you go, and you, you, you go, you go out and you get some empty vessels. Amen. And I'm not even going to tell you what to do next. You just go do that. She dismissed the things that God was about to use. Amen. Because she didn't think they would help. And she felt helpless and she was desperate. Yet God used the very things that she dismissed to demonstrate His power and His care for her and how He he can take a little bit of faith combined with what we consider meager to do amazing things. Amen. Don't you know that that's the truth? That God can take what we consider little and unimportant and He can do something with it. Hallelujah. Including ourselves. And I want to point out something to you today, church, that she had everything she needed. Listen to this. She had everything that she needed in her own house except the jars to pour into. The only thing she had to go outside the house to get were the empty jars. She had the labor, she had the product, and she had faith in God. Hallelujah. Years ago, I, I let, me, let, me just, let me just say this here, church. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this because I feel like uh, this is a, a poignant moment in our, in our church for this very message. We have everything we need in the house of God. Amen. There is sometimes a feeling of inferiority that creeps into the people of God that somehow the church is lacking uh, what we need uh, or what is needed for the work of God to be completed. We sometimes look at the, the warts of our, our, ourselves and, and the warts of uh, the, and, the, and the inadequacies of, of our congregation or whatever. We say we're small. We say we don't have this or we don't have that. We don't have a great big gigantic bank account. We don't have uh, a a, a beautiful enough building. We, uh, we, we have everything we have is old and we, we, we think that we are somehow inadequate to the task. We, we, we think that uh, somehow what we have to offer doesn't compare. Years ago, I heard someone claiming that if the church could just evangelize a few famous movie stars, that somehow their fame would be the catalyst to spark a great revival in America. You see, the insinuation was that God needed the fame of this world to spread revival. And in this scenario, the spirit-filled, blood-bought church was so inept that God needed the famous of this world to accomplish His purpose. 
But church, this is not the case. It has never been the case. It will never be the case. We do not need what the world has to offer. We need what God has to offer. And it's the Holy Ghost first and foremost. It's the Word of God first and foremost. It is a a, a body of Christ that will have faith in a great and wonderful God. We sometimes fall into the trap of looking at the flaws of ourselves, our church, and allow the enemy to gaslight us into believing that we are somehow inadequate for the God, or that God needs our help to do His work. He doesn't need you. He just wants to use you. It's a common criticism within the church to sometimes hear that if the church would just let go of some of our standards that we would grow. And I can confess to you that even as a pastor, I have been guilty of this very thing. Several years ago, I was complaining to God that it was unfair that our church didn't have uh, more of the talent that I thought that it should have. That somehow if we had just had this type of person or that type of giftedness, that we would really be able to do something for God. We sometimes allow the enemy to lead us to believe that if we just had a musical genius or a wealthy giver or a marketing guru that somehow things would really take off. God rebuked me and He told me, use the people that He placed in His church. You see, God doesn't look on the outside. God knows the heart and He can even use a donkey if needed to speak to His his truth. And if he can use a donkey, as I have been preached to by my very own wife, amen, then he can certainly use us. Amen. Amen. We weren't angry. It was just a comment. (laughs) Amen. Church, we have everything that we need already in the house of God. This woman had the the young man to go to do the work. She had the oil that was valuable, amen. And the only thing she needed to go get outside of her own house was the open vessels. Can I tell you today, church, that we have what we need for the miraculous move of God already in the house if we will become available to the King and we will put our confidence in Him rather than ourselves. Our confidence doesn't need to be in our intellect. It doesn't need to be in how cool we are. Amen. Praise God. I'll never be cool. So if that's required, then I'm done. I might as well just retire today. But right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust that God knows what He's doing and He knew what He did when He called me. Amen. And He knew what He was doing when He called you. And He knew what He was doing when He put His Spirit inside of you. Hallelujah. Church, the family of God is adequate for the work of the hour. Amen. In verse 4, we read about this woman. It says, And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. You and your sons. She didn't need to go hire more people. She didn't need to go recruit famous celebrities or local heroes. She and her sons were adequate for the work. Now, they had to show up and do it. They had to be willing to obey the man of God when he said crazy things like, just go borrow all the open vessels. Just go get all kinds of jars. Don't get a few. Get a lot. What are you going to do with these, Johnny? Uh, We're going to pour oil into them. Okay. Don't break it. Bring it back in one piece. What are you going to do with it? I don't know. We're just supposed to go get them. Okay. But they were adequate for the job at hand. She didn't need to go hire people. A friend of mine told me about a recent woes of their uh, church's music leadership. They, they're a large church and they're used to, they're, they're, this church is used to hiring a staff music minister. You know, on staff. They like have degrees and they can play 45 instruments and 
you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit here with this, but, you know, they're just like these musical people and, and they're, uh, but they're without this position. And, and at the moment they were using volunteers and one of the volunteers was a faithful woman whose family was an important family in the church, but my friend didn't like her voice and felt that she lacked the skill to be in that position. And yet there she was being used of God. And he told me about how his wife had invited a co-worker to church and afterward they inquired about uh, what they thought of the service and wanted to know if he would be back. And my co-worker uh, bemoaned to me that, uh, that, that, they, that, that this person liked the church but couldn't consider coming back if that person was going to be leading songs. And expected me to understand and commiserate and think and and say, yeah, you're right. That's terrible. They got to get that lady out of there. Now, church, I've heard this song leader. I've been in this church. I've heard the song leader. It wasn't if she was completely tone deaf or unprofessional. It wasn't painful to listen to or way off key or even lacking worship. She just wasn't Israel Hot and Torn Wells or Darlene Check. And my response was not, yeah, she should be sat down. My response was, wow, what a bad attitude. And that person isn't really hungry anyway. Because you see, church, a heart that is hungry for God won't critique the song service. They don't care. Amen. Hallelujah. A heart that is hungry for God is going to hear the voice of God through a willing heart that is sincere and submitted to God. And they're going to hear the message of God because God has divinely appointed them. They are open and they're, and, and they're going to feel the call of God and they're going to respond to it. Hallelujah. Luke 19 verse 16 says, Then came uh, the first sir, uh, saying, Master, your, my, your mina was uh, earned ten minas. And he said, Well done, good and faithful, uh, good, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Have authority over ten cities. Church, can I tell you that God is not looking for Ken and Barbie Christian. He doesn't just reward the most talented among us. He is looking for faithful and committed individuals and will use the family of God in his house to accomplish the great things that we will merely be of willing to go into the city and collect some empty vessels. He will use what's already in the house. Can I tell you that not only are the people of God what's already in the house up to the task. Amen. See, we got a big job here, folks. We, we got a big here, job here. Here we stand. I mean, Thurston County is not the biggest county in the, in the state of Washington, but here we sit. We're one of the we're one of only a handful of apostolic churches in this in this county. There, there are some others. There's other one God churches uh, that, 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 that preach righteousness and truth and, and, and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But we're, 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 we've got a big job to do to, to to reach out and to evangelize this world. Amen. It's a big job. But guess what? God knows what he needs in his kingdom. And he happened to put you here to do it. So unless you think that God is daft or unwise or incapable of evaluating talent, <laughs> amen, then we've got to believe that, hey, God knows what he's doing. He must be able to use me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Everybody say, if God can use a donkey, he can use me. <laughs> Certainly, you're smarter than a donkey. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, I'm not sure. I'm telling you, this pastor believes you're better than a donkey. <laughs> you look better than a donkey. <laughs> I tell you that, you smell better than a donkey. Praise God. Church, we are adequate for the job. Amen. God has put us in this time for this hour. 
Amen. I also often want to talk, think, think about this. God knows what this, that what this world needs. God knows what, what our generation needs. And He filled you with His Spirit. Sometimes we, we read the Bible. We read about these heroes of faith. We read about Paul. And we, and we think, my goodness, how in the world can I ever match up to that? This man is this giant. Yeah, he was good enough for the first century, but he wasn't good enough for this century because otherwise God would put him here. But instead, He put you. And some of you have been gaslighted by the devil so much that you think, and you're just like, man, poor God, he must have been off that day. <laughs> no, not a chance. Amen. He knows everything and he knows you and he knows that you are able for this generation and this hour and this place. Amen. In this community, in this congregation, hallelujah, to do the work of God that he has called us to do. And not only that, are you adequate to the, the task? But we are also under, to, to understand that the Holy Ghost is sufficient to save and to sain, sustain us in this wicked hour. He says, the, 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 the Elisha says to the woman and says, pour it into all those vessel, vessels and set aside the full ones. And he believes that you're going to have enough to go sell everything and you're going to have enough to pay off your creditor and then live on. And uh, Brother Kinsey seemed to think that it, it, the, the indication of this was that you'll be able to live on it for the rest of your life. It was that much that was provided. You're going to pay off the debt and you're going to have enough to live on. Church, can I tell you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That the oil was sufficient. I mean, yes, it was a miracle. We understand that. It was a miracle of God. But the oil, and oil is a, an important compound. It's, it's not a mistake that God chose to use this uh, particular thing. I mean, it could have been kale, I suppose. What do you have in the house? I don't have anything except this bowl of kale. Of course, God probably knew no, it would, kale wouldn't sell. <laughs> But it's not a mistake that God used oil. Amen. Because you see, oil is an important compound in the cooking life, but also used extensively in worship. The scripture uses oil as a symbol. Quite often, uh, the presence of oil symbolized gladness. Isaiah 61, while it, uh, in its absence, uh, indicated sorrow and humiliation. We read about that in Joel chapter 1. Similarly, oil was used as an, import, an image of comfort, spiritual nourishment, or prosperity. The uh, prophet Isaiah prophesied of the Messiah to come to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Represented by the oil. That's why we, when we, we pray for people, we put a little oil on them, like the scripture says, because it represents the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. That anointing comes upon us and it heals us and it empowers us. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and uh, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the, uh, the day of vengeance of our, uh, of our God, to comfort all those who mourn, to appoint... Unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And we know that Jesus read this very scripture when he stood up in, uh, in, in the synagogue and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. Why? Because he was the Messiah that was being prophesied and the anointing that was upon him to heal and to bind up and to, 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 to bring uh, peace and, 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 and be able to overcome and be able to bring healing and miracles to the people of God. Do you know that it was enough for him? But then he gives that to us through his spirit so that we also are anointed, amen, with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, is sufficient for the task. It's sufficient for salvation. It's sufficient for sustaining us. 
Just like the oil in this woman's house was sufficient to save the family and to sustain them for their whole life. And uh, the oil of the Holy Ghost in the church of the living God is sufficient to save us and to sustain us throughout our lives. The Holy Ghost was sufficient for the first century church. And the Holy Ghost was sufficient, amen, for the turn of the century church. And the Holy Ghost is still sufficient to save the millennial generation and Gen X, amen. Hallelujah, church. The Holy Ghost is not inadequate. It is sufficient. We don't need all the accoutrements of the world to build a church. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost and that will only come when the church will pour out their hearts to, uh, to God in prayer and praise and worship. Hallelujah. You say, oh, we don't have this. We don't need this. Amen. Oh, we don't have that. We don't need that. Oh, we don't have this person or that person. We don't need, amen, anything but the presence of God. But church, you and I have a responsibility to go to God in prayer and to begin to worship Him and begin to praise Him and to begin to fall upon our knees and call upon Him on a daily basis. And when we come to the church so that we will be vessels that will be filled with His Holy Spirit. We don't need a better sound system as much as we need a church that will pray and worship with all their heart to invite the Holy Ghost. Amen. The devil wants us to believe that the church is inadequate to meet the demands and the needs of this world. But the Holy Ghost is sufficient to heal every heart. The devil wants us to believe that we won't grow until we drop our standards of holiness. But the Holy Ghost is sufficient to pour out revival. Amen. The world wants us to think that the church is stunted and not growing, that we are outdated and that we need to be more modern. We are criticized for teaching uh, things like that a woman should wear feminine clothing and not cut her hair. But uh, we are called legalists when uh, we teach our men to dress modestly and stay out of the bars. But I am convinced, amen, that we do not need more of the world. We need more of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We need more prayer. We we need more praise. We need more sacrifice. We need more fasting. Hallelujah. And all we need is the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is already in the house. But there's one thing. That isn't in the house. That we're going to need to go get. The only thing that we lack are more vessels to pour into. He said, go. Borrow vessels from everywhere. From your house. Empty vessels. Don't gather just a few. Go and get vessels. the only thing they lacked they had the oil they had the people but they just lacked vessels and in this story God asked for their faith and their obedience and he used what they already had in the house to perform a great miracle the oil was what they needed to sell Hallelujah. They didn't need to sell jars. They didn't need to sell death wall decorations. There was no value in the furniture. The only thing of value was the oil. In church, the oil is the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. What this world needs is not a postmodern church with a skinny jean wearing preacher. What this church, what this world needs is not a prima donna church that knows how to put together a perfect show. That has all the sound perfectly in tune. 
that has the perfect number of uh, classrooms and uh, all the all the right uh, levels of, of, of children's ministry. What this world needs is a church that loves them and knows how to pray and is full of the Holy Ghost. What this world needs is the Spirit of God. And you and I have the Spirit of God. Amen. You and I are already in the house and you and I already have what they need. The oil was what they needed to sell. It was something that they had, they had that was of great value. And the oil didn't stop until they ran out of vessels. The oil they were able to sell was enough to pay the creditor and to lift to, enough to live on. Church, we have all that we need in the house of God. But we lack one thing that we must go and acquire. And that's new vessels to fill. God makes it clear that the responsibility is on the members of the house to go to the vessels. The oil is sufficient. And the miracles of God are available. But the oil will stay if we run out of empty vessels. Amen. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 10, verse 1 says, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also. He sent them two by two before His face into every city and place where He Himself was about to go. And they, then He said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. Church, we're sometimes lulled to sleep. I talked about how the, the enemy wants us to believe that we are inadequate, that what we have is inadequate, but we know that that's not true. The enemy wants us to believe we live here in the Pacific Northwest, right? Nobody wants God. Everybody's, everybody's you know, just like, you know, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. We live in a hostile world. We think it's so hard. Church, I believe that the harvest is plenteous. It's just that the laborers need to keep going into the harvest. Amen. You say, oh, you don't understand. Yeah, I do understand. I've grown up here my whole life. Amen. And yeah, it's different. We're not the Bible Belt. We're not Africa. We, you know, you don't hear too many times where, you know, we're filling up uh, stadiums full of 50,000 people and, you know, 2,500 people get the Holy Ghost all the same. I get that. But if the laborers will come into the house and receive the sustenance that they need filled with the Holy Ghost, and if we will go out of the house and we will continue to search, amen, maybe we have to look a little harder. Maybe we have to uh, uncover a few more rocks. Maybe we have to talk to a few more people, amen. Maybe we don't just run into, you know, 45 people in the first hour who all just were ready to receive the Holy Ghost. But if we will keep going into the harvest, we will find those who are hungry. If we don't let the enemy tell us Nobody wants this. Amen. Now, I'm going to be the, an honest preacher with you today. Amen. I've heard it. I've gone to conferences. I've gone to, uh, to things. I've grown up in this church. And, and, uh, and, and I've heard it said, everybody wants what we have. Mm, not so sure. I've met a few that didn't. I'm not going to tell you that everybody wants what we have. But that doesn't bring us to the conclusion, amen, it's true, not everybody wants it, amen. I believe that because I've run into a few that just clearly did not. Family members, co-workers, you name it. Let's be honest with it. I see some heads going, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, we've been there. But the lie of the enemy comes when he tries to tell you that just because everybody doesn't want it, that means that nobody wants it. That's a lie from the enemy too. Amen. 
There are hearts that are hungry for God. Amen. And maybe sometimes, sometimes there, 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 there are hearts that are hungry for the Lord, but they're not ready to commit to God. But yet, if we will still plant the seed, amen, sometime down the road, that seed will be able to germinate. Maybe it's not in my church. Maybe it's not, amen, in your, uh, in your Bible study, but somewhere along the, the, the road, amen, if we will keep planting the seed and keep going into the harvest and keep talking to people and keep bringing vessels to the house of God, we say, I brought somebody to church and they didn't want to come back oh boo hoo cry yourself asleep for the rest of your life I've been here 10 years <laughs> there's a lot of people who left this door boo hoo what am I going to do I'm going to keep going into the harvest and keep talking to vessels I'm going to keep preaching the word of God amen Hallelujah. Praise God, because my responsibility is to God. And I know I know for sure the church won't grow if I quit. I mean, I'm not just talking about me being the pastor. Somebody else will come in. They'll probably do a better job. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I'm never going to produce fruit if I just sit at home and watch Netflix for the rest of my life. While I'm on that subject, some of us need to turn Netflix off and invite somebody over for a Bible study. Just saying. Amen. Should I meddle a little bit longer? Amen. Oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. But you got to not time to watch six hours, stay up till two in the morning, uh, binge watching some mindless, you know, superhero program. Amen. Just saying. Not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying we have time. It's just about what we choose to do with our time. Amen. Would you stand with me and as our musicians come? Church, I don't want us to believe the lies of the enemy. Amen. That the church is not what we're supposed to be. Amen. Yeah, maybe we get tired from time to time. Maybe we make a few missteps. Amen. Maybe we don't make the pancakes just right every time. Praise God. But God showed me something. As my prayer in searching for advice brought me to the conclusion that God wanted me to remain as the pastor at Abundant Life in the days and weeks following the revelation that my former wife had backslidden and completely and was uh, going to divorce me without cause. I really believed that this would be an extremely lonely journey. I had finally come to grips with it and I finally, because I really did, I wasn't sure if I should stay here. I, I, felt, I felt horrible. I felt like the church deserved better. That's what I felt like. Church deserved better. But I finally came to the conclusion after uh, consulting with, with leadership. And, and you know, if my leadership would have said, yeah, Nathan, you need, to, you need to step away, I'd have been out the door. But as I prayed and I felt led to stay, and I said, I, I, they, I, I consulted with leadership and they said, they, they said, well, how, how, how are you feeling? Like, they knew all the, you know, they knew what was going on. They were very well aware of the situation. And I said, I, I just don't feel released to go. I, I feel like I should stay. But I'm not sure because I feel like the church deserves better. And so we came to that conclusion. But I truly believed that this would be such a lonely journey. And I, I worried that the church, I worried the church would leave. Maybe I would just decide to stay, but half the church would say, eh, yeah, yeah, too bad, sucker. That's not going to work for me. And we had people, I can tell you, I can, I can, I can I'm not going to, going to point out who it, who it is not here, but I remember when uh, people would come uh, to the church and, and when, when I, I told them of my search, I could see on their face and they're just like, eh, and I knew they wasn't coming back. Because I was not qualified. So I expected that. 
And I worried. I worried the church would leave. I accepted the fate of being shunned by my ministerial peers. I really believed that I would be seen as a pariah, ignored and looked upon. I knew that I would be tolerated because I had the technical qualifications. I had not done anything immoral. I, I, I followed all the rules that we have within our fellowship. Um, I, I, I tried to do everything with the utmost integrity the, to the best of my ability. And so I had the technical qualifications to remain in ministry, but I feared the judgment that I would be, that I believed would be in the hearts of the people of our fellowship. But do you know, church, I was so wrong. I was so wrong. Jesus. Instead of judgment and gossip, I received encouragement and prayer. Instead of being ignored, I was embraced and included. Other ministers Amen. spoke kind words uh, and even opportunities to preach uh, out were offered when I expected them to be non-existent. I, didn't, I expected for, for the rest of my life, I'll never preach anywhere except for here. And not that I'm really looking for that, but you know, it's kind of, it kind of feels good to, for somebody to say, hey, I want you to come preach to our church. Wow. Okay, cool. God can use me somewhere else. Because, you see, a pastor doesn't invite somebody to their church unless they feel there's some kind of value that they bring to the congregation. That's, that's how I operate. Right. I don't just... just get, I, I, I look for people that are going to bring something to us. They have something to offer. And other ministers spoke kind words to me. Even opportunities to preach were given... This week at summer conference, Teresa and I were overwhelmed by the outpouring of congratulations and smiles and genuine joy at our, at our union. That God could take something that was just a vessel of bitterness and put the oil of joy in. You see, the body of Christ really has been the balm of Gilead in my life. The church didn't tuck and run. The body of Christ didn't start talking and sniping. And not one person, not one phone call ever came to me that said, you should leave, you should quit. Not, not a single one. See, the body of Christ really was the body of Christ to me. And I, I discovered in that, I discovered that, you know what? The church really is the church. Because I had been lied to by the enemy. Right. To say, oh, the church is just judgmental. Oh, the church is just so full of the flesh. Oh, the church is just going to come to make assumptions. Oh, the body of Christ, they're not going to be what the body of Christ is supposed to be. The hands and the feet and the heart of God. But they were. They are. <laughs> we are. Church, I have more confidence in, in our fellowship than I ever have in my whole life. And I've never been one to, to, to be super negative about uh, the fellowship, the United Pentecostal Church and all, and all, and all of this. I, I've never been one to be super negative. But there are, as I've pointed out, I didn't expect, <laughs> amen, the church to be the church. But I've found, amen, everything that I need is in the house. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not saying our fellowship is the most perfect thing since, you know, the inception of the church. I'm not saying this church doesn't have our difficulties and challenges. Amen. But what I'm saying is that everything that we need is in the house. And God can use even me, as imperfect, as inadequate, and as handicapped as I believed I was going to be, God can use even that 
if I'll just say, okay, God, here I am. I don't have to look for some new revelation. I don't have to go look outside. I just, I've, got, I've got you. Amen. I don't have to look at some, for some new great program. I don't have to revamp the whole structure of the church. Although we will keep tinkering, don't worry. But what I need is God. And we have Him. What we need and what the world needs is a church that has experienced the, the, the presence of God, has experienced the Holy Ghost, and we are it. We have what we need in the house. But what we don't have enough of is more vessels. Because as long as there's no more vessels, the oil will stop. But as long as there's another vessel, they went and looked. It says that they went and they looked and they came back and they're like, oh, we're out. <laughs> if they'd have found another jar, there would have been more oil. If it was me and I was noticing that, I'd have been like, dude, let's go. You, you, Mom, take a minute, fill these up. You've got six more. We're going to get more. <laughs> We're not only going to live for our lives, but we're going to put a little away for the grandkids. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Never before have I had such confidence in the church of God and the body of Christ. It really is the genuine source of love and compassion and the heart of God that we want it to be. The church was sufficient for me found everything I needed to heal, everything I needed to grow, everything I needed to relaunch in the house of God, and He will too. Hallelujah. I'm going to open up these altars. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you would come and if you would say, God, Lord, I'm not going to look elsewhere. I'm not going to look for some new revelation. I'm not going to, I'm not going to believe the lies of the enemy that I'm not enough. But Lord God, just fill me with your spirit. Just saturate with me with your presence. Lord God, let me be the fulfillment of what you see in me, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah.